Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos walking through the entire open free textbook, a foundation course in reading German, by moving on now to the sixth unit, covering the objectives you see listed on the screen, most importantly, the grammatical topics of conjunctions and comparatives. Now, if we consider conjunctions first, these are usually represented in cartoon form with the analogy of pieces of a puzzle. Now, if you think about it, if you have a jigsaw um, a puzzle with various pieces, and two of them look like they should be in the same general neighborhood of that puzzle, uh, but they cannot be directly joined to one another because the two pieces simply don't fit. If you find, however, an intermediary puzzle piece, um, which can fit with both of them, then you can string all three of them together into a composite whole, which if we extend the uh, analogy to a grammatical sense, um, also satisfies the conditions for a grammatical sentence. So what this means in terms of language is that um, words like and allow you to combine things which otherwise for example, might be um, independent sentences, which would have to be um, ended by a period, and then you begin a new sentence. Well, if you use the word and, you can drop the period after the first of those and simply uh, string them together into a larger whole, which is still technically just one sentence. Um, it's interesting that the conjunction but actually is just the word and in disguise, as Frigga revealed with modern logical notation, that when you use the word but, um, you actually are just doing the same thing. You're stringing together units meaning into a composite whole, um, and the only difference between the two um, is uh, really uh, rhetorical or psychological. So from the standpoint of a robot or a computer, um, and and but are the same thing. Um, but uh, from a human standpoint, you use the word but to convey a sense of maybe hesitation. You have a sentence like, um, you can come with us to the movies, but you have to pay for your own ticket. Well, you really are just saying and, but um, in order to convey rhetorically a certain hesitation, use the word but. Well, there are other conjunctions listed here, which are um, also allowing you to combine units of meaning, but they're not quite like the first two we considered. Because, and although, as we'll get back to in much uh, greater detail later, also allow you to combine things, but um, on a qualitative level, um, one of the units is not quite the same as the other. And we'll come back later to the idea of independent and dependent clauses, but in addition to that, um, in German, the very rules for word order will change if you use these so-called subordinating conjunctions. Now, this is the thing which even this slide emphasizes, that um, in German, the difference between coordinating and subordinating conjunctions is not merely a matter of the kind of clause which um, they join. Uh, coordinating conjunctions join two independent units of meaning, largely, while subordinating conjunctions allow you to join an independent and dependent. Well, in addition to that, the very rules for word order will be changed if you have one of these subordinating conjunctions set off that little um, temporary suspension of the ordinary rules. It's kind of like in the Mario franchise, if you uh, get the uh, star, you're invincible for a little bit of time. It's, it's kind of like that. You might consider you get the, uh, you know, the, uh, the leaf in Mario Brothers 3, now you're a raccoon for a little bit who can fly, you might think of it in those terms. But if we go on now to consider the coordinating conjunctions first, um, these are, uh, from the standpoint of the textbook, the conjunctions which do not alter the word order of the sentence. According to the textbook itself, the most common German coordinating conjunctions arranged in alphabetical order include the following. Aber is but or however. Den is for or because, entweder slash oder, these are a pair of coordinating conjunctions which appear together, is much like in English, either or, oder is or, uh, sondern is but or rather used after a negative, um, sowohl and als are a pair which mean as well as, um, und perhaps <laughs> the most common, um, und is and, and then we have the pair weder, data, dat, noch, which is neither nor, simply the negative of either or. Now, if we consider the textbook's uh, sentences as examples, um, we'll see the following. Um, er lernt fleißig, denn er findet Deutsch schwer. Um, he studies hard is one complete thought. Um, he finds German difficult is another thought. Well, these are so related, almost in terms of um, providing an explanation for why one of them provides an explanation for the other, why it happens, um, that we should really join them into one sentence, and the uh, conjunction den allows us to do just that. 
So we consider the next sentence, he geht in der Latin und kauft ein neues Fahrrad. Well, you get the sense that these really should be joined because um, we have the same grammatical subject, she, so it would be too redundant to simply break those up into two different sentences. And really there is um, a relation between the two thoughts. She goes into the shop because she's trying to buy a bicycle. She's not going in there just for the hell of it. You have the next sentence, uh, wir gehen nicht ins Kino, sondern in die Bibliothek. So we have... Um, here a contrast. We are not doing the first thing, but instead, or rather, we are doing the second. That's why you want to join these into one sentence rather than break it up into two. Then we have, Entweder wir fahren mit dem Bus oder wir gehen zu Fuß. Oh, so here we have a choice. Either we're taking the bus or we're walking. Okay, that's why you want to join them into one sentence. And once again, the conjunction allows you to do just that. You may have noticed in those sentences that um, the word order rules for one sentence um, uh, applied to either of the uh, uh, clauses within the one sentence. So the ordinary rules for word word within a sentence you might keep in mind, there are many of them, but one of them is that the conjugated verb appears in that second position. Um, that's more stable even than the position of the subject, which may appear at the beginning, but not always. There might be some other unit there. Well, that uh, conjugated verb still appears in the second. Well, um, with subordinating conjunctions, once again, those ordinary rules for word order are temporarily suspended, and the biggest difference is that that um, conjugated verb appears now at the end. This is why uh, the textbook itself basically um, defines from the beginning subordinating conjunctions as those conjunctions that do affect the word order of the sentence. Okay, um, If you consider the following example, you will see how this works uh, concretely. Uh, sie wohnte in Berlin als ihre Eltern noch Studenten waren. Now, the first half of that sentence roughly has the ordinary word order. Uh, Wohnte, the conjugated verb lived, is in the second position. But in the uh, second um, half, roughly, of that sentence, you see the conjugated verb wachen at the very end. And that's what makes this challenging for uh, speakers of English who are used to the idea of independent dependent clauses, but not used to the idea that the word order would change in, uh, in uh, depending on which of those two it is. Now, the textbook tells us, quite interestingly, that if you have the um, subordinating um, the subordinate clause appear at the first position of the sentence rather than the second, as you might be more used to, um, the interesting thing is that the conjugated verb of the um, independent clause simply follows right after the whole dependent clause. Now, that's kind of a grammatical mouthful, but what you could see concretely is in the sentence, als sie jung war, wohnte sie in Berlin. Okay, so we have um, this uh, inversion of word order, perhaps even within the uh, independent clause, perhaps because that conjugated um, verb is appearing um, in a roughly second position relative to that whole first unit of meaning, which is the dependent clause itself. Of course, this begs the question, if a subordinate clause is subordinate, what is it subordinate to, or what is it dependent on? Well, the one way to think of this is that um, a dependent clause is one which is dependent because it cannot make sense all by itself. Um, it is not something which you could simply uh, chop out the other clause, uh, put a period at the end, and have a grammatical sentence, as would be the case if you were using an independent clause, such as, um, I live in India and I like living in India. Well, each one of those could be its own sentence, but if you have an example like, um, take I borrowed from a study.com, you have um, two different units of meaning, one of which can stand on its own, the other one of which cannot. You have I, the broader sense, I survived the shipwreck, although I lost all my luggage. Well, I survived the shipwreck, is something which can stand on its own, but although I lost all my luggage, really cannot. That is not a full sentence, okay? You have uh, the other example from the same uh, image, I survived the shipwreck as I am Aquaman. We might also translate that as I survived the shipwreck because I am Aquaman, meaning I can survive indefinitely in the ocean, right? So um, if we try to turn that into its own sentence, uh, because I am Aquaman, well, that is not something which can stand on its own. So the subordinating conjunctions as such, we will consider um, one at a time, at least in the, exam uh, the list provided by the textbook itself. In alphabetical order, this begins with als, which is when in the sense of referring to past events. For example, als er in Deutschland war, sah er seinen Bruder. When he was in Germany in the past, he saw his brother. 
caution, the word, textbook tells us. This word also has uses as an adverb, in which case it behaves like a normal adverb. For example, you use it to talk about what is uh, uh, more such and such than something else. For example, you could talk about that which is better than by speaking of that which is besser als something else. Then you have um, also the idea of uh, filling a role. Um, he did it as a such and such, a lawyer, whatever. If we consider the next subordinate conjunction, bis meaning until we have the sentence, bis es regnet, bleibt es trocken. Until it rains, it will remain dry. Next subordinate conjunction is da, which means since or because. The sentence, ich gehe nicht ins Kino, da ich kein Geld habe. I don't go to the movies because I have no money. Now, da also means there, so you do have to be careful with this. This is not the da of Dasein, which is the being or the existence which is there. This is rather an explanation, okay, of why uh, something is uh, the case that you already brought up. I'm not going to the movies. Why? Because I don't have any money, okay? Now we have the next uh, uh, subordinate conjunction, damit. Now that is not dammit in English, that is rather damit, which means so that. Damit sie das Examen bestehen, sollen sie fleißig studieren. So that you pass the exam, okay, you should study hard. So we're trying to um, provide a, uh, a reason or a motivation for why you're studying. Well, why am I studying? Oh, so that you can pass the exam. Okay. Caution. This is not to be confused with the da compound, meaning with it, which uh, we also have uh, considered. The next subordinating conjunction, das, means uh, that in the sense of uh, die Kinder wussten sehr voll, das Feuer gefährlich ist. The children knew very well that a fire is dangerous. Like English, the textbook tells us German sometimes omits this very common conjunction because it's basically implied. Um, and you can tell that that has happened when the word order of the subordinate clause appears in normal German statement order. And more helpfully than in English, the textbook tells us such sentences in German will always use a comma to signal where one clause ends and the next one begins. For example, Ich glaube, ich kriege ein Fahrrad zum Geburtstag. I think I'm getting a bicycle for my birthday is what you would say in English as itself an example of a deletion of the conjunction that simply on grounds that it's so predictable as to basically um, communicate no information. Remember the linguistic uh, rule or law that there is an inverse relation between probability and information content. If a unit is fully predictable, you can delete it without losing any meaning because the, um, the uh, listener can automatically restore that unit that had been deleted. Well, this is one of the best examples of that. Um, we very rarely use it even within English except in very formal contexts. But of course, if we had included it, the word order once again would change in response to the explicit presence of that conjunction. Consider the same sentence but with das added gives us the word order ich glaube das ich einfacher zum Geburtstag kriege rather than ich glaube ich kriege einfacher zum Geburtstag. Once again that conjugated verb appearing at the end. Before, which means before, much like in English we can see in the sentence uh, before es regnete sahen wir Wolken. Before it rained, we saw clouds. Nachdem means after, as we see um, in the sentence, erst nachdem der Schnee schmilzt, sieht man Tulpen. Not until after the snow melts can one see tulips. Ob means whether or if used only for true slash false possibilities, like wir wissen nicht, ob er kommt. We don't know if he's coming. Of course, this is true or false. Either he's coming or he's not. Obwohl um, or obgleich means although in the sense of obwohl zwei fertig waren, blieben noch drei in Arbeit. Although two were done, three were still being worked on. Seitdem means since the time when or ever since. Seitdem uh, sie heirateten, reisen die, uh, sie jedes Jahr nach Mallorca, a very uh, lovely uh, tourist destination in Spain you see on the screen. Ever since they got married, they travel there every year. Sobald means as soon as. Wir fliegen sobald das Unwetter vorbei ist. We'll fly as soon as the uh, storm has passed. If you've ever had a flight delayed due to weather, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, 
so long is as long as the example so long as so stark regnet starten wir nicht as long as it rains this hard we will not take off Welchen is while or whereas example Welchen er auf der Universität studierte lernte er seine Frau um, kennen. While he was at uh, while he was a university student, he got to know his wife. Caution: This is not to be confused with its use as a preposition meaning during, which will give you the normal prepositional word order. Very important to consider. Next, we have weil, which means because. One of the most common ones you will deal with. For example, ich trinke nachmittags Kaffee, weil ich dann schläfrig bin. Um, I drink coffee in the afternoon because that's when I get sleepy. Anyone who um, knows uh, what it's like to go into a caffeine withdrawal about five hours after you have your morning coffee knows exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, the next and final one we'll consider is then, which means whenever or if used to set a condition. The example, wenn es regnet, fährt sie mit dem Bus, nicht mit dem Fahrrad. We can finally move on from conjunctions to comparisons. Up to this point, the textbook tells us we have dealt with adjectives, but only in the positive form of talking about that which is small as klein, that which is read as rot, etc. But now we consider the possibility of using certain linguistic um, capabilities within German to talk about um, um, things which are more of that quality than others. We can compare that which is small to that which is smaller, that which is red to that which is redder, and we can even expand that to the um, maybe uh, winner of the whole content, so it's that which is not just smaller but smallest, that which is not just redder but reddest, etc. So the uh, form of the comparative in German is luckily uh, more consistent than that of English. In English, the textbook tells us sometimes we use the word more to signal a comparison. For example, it's more consistent than something else. And um, sometimes we do not use the word more, but instead add the suffix er. For example, we don't say it's more green, we say it's greener. My uh, linguistics professor in college years ago claimed that the rule of thumb to know when to use more or when to add the suffix er is the uh, number of um, um, sounds within a given word. If it's less than two syllables, um, excuse me, if it's it's two or less syllables, I think then you add er. So uh, green is only one syllable, that's why we say greener, okay, taller. But if it's, uh, you know, multiple, like beautiful, beautiful is three, you would not say um, she's beautifuler than uh, the other girl. No, she's more beautiful, right? Okay, so we move on now to um, the textbook's analysis of how this is done in German, which is simply to add an er to all its adjectives. The comparative of grün then becomes grüna. Note that on adjectives with the vowels a, o, and u, an umlaut is usually added in the comparative form. For example, groß, big becomes größer or bigger, a schwarz, black, becomes a schwätze, or blacker, okay? As far as sentence constructions go, German uses the comparative form of adjectives, though in much the same way as in English. We consider the examples um, with als, which means then, der stille Ozean ist größer als die Atlantik. The Pacific Ocean is um, bigger, okay, größer than the Atlantic Ocean is, as you see the graphic on the screen. Um, with je and desto or umso, we get sentences like je alter ich werde, okay, desto weiser bin ich, je alter ich werde, okay, with that umlaut, uh, desto weiser bin ich, the older I become, the wiser I am also. Uh, je reicher er wird, umso öfter fährt er un in Urlaub. The richer he gets, the more often he travels on vacation. Isn't that the entire point of uh, getting a pay raise, after all? I um, have some other uses, too. With immer, um, you have statements like, um, er läuft immer schneller. He runs faster and faster, is how we um, would translate that in English. But the idea here is that um, we have the uh, comparative schneller, faster, but we um, have a comparison not with somebody else, but rather with one's own action. He's running faster than himself <laughs> progressively as each moment passes, is basically the idea here. The textbook tells us that when comparative forms of adjectives are used in front of nouns, they must, like all other adjectives, have the appropriate endings. Consequently, in order to translate or read correctly, you must look closely at the form of the adjective preceding the noun. Considering the following, gestern war ein schöner 
Tag. But vorgestern war ein schönerer Tag. In the first example, read schöne as schön plus the adjectival ending e. Okay. In the second, however, read schönere as schön plus the comparative suffix er plus the adjectival ending er. So we have here two different senses of er which might otherwise perhaps be confused. Thus, when translating, you must analyze the adjectival endings before rendering your translation into English. Otherwise, you may mistake a normal adjective ending for a comparative suffix or vice versa. I move on to the idea of superlatives. In English, superlative adjectives are either prefaced by most, as in um, she's the most beautiful in the entire village, as a small village, but still the biggest fish in a little pond. <laughs> um, and we use the word most to convey that sort of uh, position of being the best out of that whole set. Well, um, we also, however, add the suffix est in much the same way that we do for er. And according to my professor, uh, once again, um, it was uh, the the number of syllables in the word which determine which of those two it will be. Um, big is the short word, so that's what we say bigger, biggest, okay? Whereas uh, beautiful is uh, three units long before we add any of the uh, endings. In German, however, you will always see the suffix est or uh, simply st on the adjective as the only way to indicate superlative meaning. A general rule is this. If the root adjective ends in d or t, then you add est. Otherwise, you simply add st. For example, klein, which is small, becomes kleinst, which is the smallest, whereas uh, rot, which is red, becomes rotest. Once again, we have the um, presence of a D or a T to determine if it's at the end of that word, which of it, those it will be. Usually, you will see superlatives as modifiers of a noun, the textbook tells us, with the appropriate adjective ending appended after the superlative suffix. If you consider the superlative adjective Eltest, which is the oldest, then you have the sentence Das ist das älteste Buch in unserer Bibliothek. The oldest book in our library, as you see on the screen there, um, is quite old. In fact, it's the oldest. Um, German uses this superlative form a different way when the adjective is not modifying a noun. For example, um, uh, der Mercedes ist am teuersten. The Mercedes is the most expensive. The form is always um, or contraction of an and dem, which is, um, of course, the uh, dative form, okay, followed by the superlative form of the adjective plus the grammatically appropriate adjective ending en. We now move on to the important topic of adjectives as adverbs. Well, it's rather easy, I think it's straightforward in um, English to differentiate the two because typically an adverb simply is an adjective with the suffix li added onto it. Hot is an adjective, hot li is an adverb, although that is admittedly a strange example for the uh, textbook to be using, but at any rate, in German, there is no such visible difference when a word is used either as an adverb or as an adjective. This applies even for the comparative and superlative adjectives the textbook tells us. In all cases, you must tell from context which meaning is being used. The example is from the textbook. Das Kind liest gut is uh, the child reads well. Here, gut is an adverb rather than an adjective. But we also have um, er läuft schneller, which is he runs more quickly. Now, schneller is um, an adverb talking about how he runs. And uh, sie läuft am schnellsten is also an adverb saying how she runs. Well, she runs the fastest. There are a few commonly used superlative words that are used only as adverbs such as host, which is highly, ausus, which is extremely, and meistens, which is mostly. For example, dieses Buch is host interessant. This book is highly interesting, in fact, it's uh, the most highly, or it's the highest interesting, is how we'd roughly translate that into English. The textbook also tells us that you will often see superlative constructions with um used in an adverbial sense, especially based on the adverbial meanings of the superlative adjectives best, meist, und wenigst. Uh, for example, meine Freunde haben gute Bute, aber mein Boot ist am besten ausgestattet. My friends have good boats, but my boat is the best equipped. Sylvia's boot is am wenigsten ausgestattet. Sylvia's boat is the least well equipped. Sylvia brauchte am meisten unsere Hilfe. Um, Sylvia needed our help the most. Though, of course, uh, the uh, relation between gut and best as something of an irregular comparison is something that we will return to in greater detail in 
uh, the next unit. Now we move on to the important uh, topic of the Zovi construction, so called in which we have an ability to express a comparison of equation equivalent to the English expression as slash as. For example, she runs as quickly as he does. We have the, the two ases here in um, English. Well, in uh, German, we would use so wie to say sie läuft so schnell wie er. Ihre Wohnung ist so groß wie die Wohnung ihrer Freundin. Her apartment is as large as her friend's apartment, as you can see on the screen. Now we move on to the important topic of verb formation. Now in Unit 5, we dealt with the formation of nouns from verbs and common adjectives, you might remember. But now we'll have to look at the formation of verbs from adjectives and their different forms. For example, we have breit, which is broad or wide, but we have um, the uh, verb verbreiten, which is to broaden or to widen, a little bit like how we would do in English. We then have ganz, which means whole, and ergänzen, which means to make whole or to complete. Große is bigger, and vergrossen is to make bigger or to increase. Länger is longer, verlängern is to make larger or to lengthen. Klar is clear, erklären is to make clear, or as we would normally translate, to explain, to clarify, right? Um, then we have rot, which is red, and then erhoten is to make red or to blush. So it tells us that German also changes verbs into nouns by capitalizing the word and then adding a noun ending. Thus, using some of our examples from above, we see that verbreiten is to broaden, but the verbreitung is the widening. Ergänzen is to make whole, but erg the ergänzung is the completion. Vergrossen is to make bigger, but the vergrossung is the enlargement. Then we have verlängern is to make larger, um, and then the verlängerung is the lengthening. Then we have erklärung, which is to make clear, and the erklärung, very important term in philosophy, is the explanation. So we kind of have this uh, recursive um, application of rules to uh, turn from one category to another and then turn that into another category, which is, of course, what makes German so much fun to study from a grammatical perspective. Um, and that will complete our unit six video. Thank you so much for watching.